Um, good afternoon. Says my name is Mark Gaverson. Um, I do not only work at the EBET Institute at the University of Amsterdam, but I'm also affiliated to the Research Group Philosophy and Public Affairs, the Ethics Department from the University of Amsterdam. Um, title of this talk is Limits to PES, Payments for Ecosystem Services, and RED Plus. I'll focus on the PES schemes because RED Plus is one variety of payments for ecosystem services. Or what does this title mean? I take a very broad global perspective. I'm a moral philosopher. I'm allowed to do so. Also, economists are fond of making huge simplifications and probably you want to for the oversimplifications. But the question I want to raise is, we have now this huge popularity of past schemes. It's still small scale. And are we able, is it feasible to really scale it up to global, uh, to global scale. But why is PES so popular? It is because it is able to achieve two goals at the same time, popular goals. And one, of course, is the conservation of ecosystem services. But the second one is poverty alleviation. The um, areas which are most endangered, are the most important from an ecological perspective to protect. Many of them are in the larger, poorer regions of the globe. So the idea is that by best we can combine two objectives. The question <coughs> I told you I want to raise is how far can these contributions go? For those who missed the <coughs> introductions this morning, one short introduction or for the main idea behind financial incentives, such as uh, PES schemes. The idea is that landowners basically have a choice between ecosystem conservation and using the land for other purposes to convert land. For housing, for example, agricultural, agriculture, roads, etc. When land is conserved, the landowner can literally reap the benefits of the ecosystems. That those are the fruits that can be privately appropriated. These are the private benefits to landowners. But if the landowner converts the land for other purposes, there are other private benefits, for example, of agriculture. And in many cases, these benefits outweigh the private benefits of land conservation. And therefore, often, land is converted. And the idea about putting in place financial incentives is that there are not only private benefits of ecosystem services, but also, of course, the public benefits. Benefits which are reaped by larger communities and perhaps the global community. And if you add these public benefits to the private benefits, then it outweighs the private benefits of land conversion. So the idea is that if you can give landowners an incentive to include the public benefits in their considerations as well, there's a larger chance, in many cases, land is conserved instead of converted. But as I told you, although it's highly popular, it's still small scale. There are hundreds of initiatives but it's far from sufficient to really make a dent in uh, the conservation of global ecosystem services. Well, I, I don't want to be too, be too hard, but I just put this uh, remark, a drop in the ocean here. It's not really like that, of course. But you could say that in society, about 5% um, of the people is willing to voluntarily include social benefits, to take into account social benefits. And the same holds for companies, probably. But the majority of companies and consumers, um, they're not bad consumers or companies, um, unwilling, but they're not willing to take higher costs if they have the idea that they're taken advantage of by free riders. 
So most people are very willing to do good things for the environment, but only under compulsory schemes. And pest schemes are presently voluntary, and that's the reason why it still remains quite small scale, not really huge financial flows are initiated. And because it's small scale, there are many international calls by the Conference of Parties, by the European Union, by the G8, for the, introduction, for the introduction of larger financial schemes and funds. And when you look at pest schemes or protected areas, also to protect areas, designated areas, you need money to conserve them. So there are larger schemes globally required to counterbalance the economic forces presently to convert. Well, this of course reminds us of a famous old paper by Gerhard Harden, biologist, Tragedy of the Commons. If everything remains voluntary and people only take their private benefits and costs into account, it leads to a tragedy in the end, a complete degradation of ecosystems. And what is required in Harden's words is mutual coercion, mutually agreed upon. In other words, compulsory action by government. So what we're doing in our research is looking for these kind of compulsory global schemes. What kind of global instruments can be developed to protect and to include these external benefits, these social benefits of the ecosystems. The problem these instruments, is that the questions about efficiency, effectiveness, and equity become much more pressing. If things are small scale, the few percent of society um, is willing to do things without really considering if it's efficient or not. But if you have huge financial flows between countries, which are perhaps required to really protect ecosystems in this globe, then um, countries really want to be sure that it's efficient, but also that it's fair. Now, I already mentioned the famous article by Gerhard Harden. There is an even more famous article by the economist Ronald Coase, The Problem of Social Cost, in which he explained that an instrument which is perfectly efficient or effective, um, how you give shape to that instrument, irrespective how the financial flows go, in what direction, who owns what, and who is entitled to something, <coughs> and who should pay the other. So, for example, we could ask the question should the world pay Brazil for ecosystem services, by pests, or the other way around, should Brazil pay the world for any time that they degrade ecosystems according to a polluter pace principle? According to this uh, idea of the coast, it doesn't matter. Both systems can be perfectly efficient and effective in protecting ecosystems. But from the point of fair of course, in which direction do you think? There are various of fairness, distribution of fairness. simple distinction, the distinction between the ideas of negative rights and positive rights. Negative rights are rights that people do something to you, that they refrain from <coughs> acts. So negative rights to your property is that people do not touch your property, do not harm you, in body, for example. These are the strongest moral intuitions. Principle. <laughs> Perhaps that's the reason why there are the national and international laws. Positive rights, on the other hand, are rights that people do things. If you're in need, if you don't have food, that people help you. If you don't have housing, that you get aid in that direction. But positive rights, there's much more discussion. at all. It's typically between left, um, left wing and right wing. 
assumption are entitled So you could say that in that case, the most important ecosystem are in the developing countries that are I want to make a comparison to climate change, because in that case it works quite well. Um, there is not much discussion that the developed countries have emitted the most greenhouse gases and that therefore they are the most responsible for the problem of climate and climatic change. And according to the polluter base principle, it's logical that if climate change will lead to damage and harm in developing countries, that the Western world, the wealthier countries, pay the cost. So that would already result in financial flows from, can I say, north to south, <coughs> developed to developing countries. You could also look at it from another perspective, but still within this idea of negative rights. There's also the idea of the global atmosphere, atmosphere <coughs> the global commons. The atmosphere has an absorption capacity for carbon dioxide. And then again, we can say, uh, well, this is a global commons, no one made this absorption capacity, so we could say that the whole world community has an equal right to that capacity. And once again, the Western world has emitted the most, has put the largest claim on this absorption capacity. So, there is good reason for financial flows from developed to developing countries to pay for using this larger share of this global commons. So from both ideas, polluter pays principle, or this equal right to a global commons, you both would have north-south transfers. So there, the positive rights, the wish to aid, to help, the developing world can combine with the focus on negative rights. But in the case of ecosystem services, it doesn't work that nicely. The negative rights may point the other way. If you would apply exactly the same principles as many moral philosophers and economists, um, and perhaps the green movement applies in the case of climate change, if you use, would use the same principles in the case of ecosystem services, <coughs> perhaps you get not uh, the answers you would like to have. It goes without saying that the Western world is the most responsible for emitting carbon dioxide. But at this moment, we could say that the pressure which is exerted on ecosystems takes mostly place in developing countries, at least directly. Another question is whether they exert this pressure for export to wealthier countries, then things change a little, a lot. Um, so the question becomes, who is entitled to the ecosystem services? And that's a different question from who is entitled to ecosystems or land. You can be entitled to land and to reap the fruits of ecosystems, uh, ecosystems without having the right to alter its states. So perhaps you can compare it to living in a monument. You own the monument, you are allowed to sell the monument, but you're not allowed to <coughs> change things in the monument. So who owns the ecosystem services? Well, in law and also in some thoughts in moral philosophy, the idea is that how do you own something to 
by being the first to use it. <coughs> However, the global use of ecosystem services preceded any private appropriation of land or ecosystems. That gives a reason to consider global ecosystem services truly as a global commons to which the whole world is equally entitled. And this, this kind of reasoning is all from the perspective of negative rights and it has nothing to do with poor or wealthy relations. And to stimulate intuitions about that, you can compare it to the case, just imagine that all ecosystem services originated from Switzerland, or tomorrow they'll find out that all oxygen on this globe comes from a place which the Swiss were not aware of, it comes from Switzerland. Could they then charge for extra oxygen? Or would the world say, hey, this is a global ecosystem service. Accidentally, it's in your country, but you should leave it alone. So they should pay when they alter that state. So if we believe the Earth's absorption capacity for carbon dioxide is a global commons, then why ecosystem services, services shouldn't be as well. Or if we believe the polluter should pay, in the case of the emission of greenhouse gas emissions, then why not in the case of ecosystem degradation? <coughs> so it looks like that the polluter pays principle is a much more straightforward moral principle than that the polluter is paid, which you could consider payment for ecosystem services as some kind of the polluted phase. The one who is degrading the ecosystems would be paid for not degrading it. Which can be compared to the situation that if you have a car and you will not drive, you will be paid for not driving your car. Which is the other way around from the uh, polluted place principle. So perhaps, and that's the major discussion point, <coughs> on a global scale it's better to decouple the principles of protecting the environment and poverty alleviation. So you should have simultaneously polluted place principle to protect ecosystems and dedicated instruments for poverty alleviation. And just to make this point clear, I have one final example. Um, so a poor landowner would pay if he would degrade <coughs> ecosystems, but he could simultaneously receive financial help to alleviate poverty. Those could be two different instruments. Because what happens if you would not decouple these instruments? What would happen? If this poor landowner, who is receiving payment for ecosystem services, for example, would sell his land to a wealthy company or a wealthy landowner. Well, in this scheme, the wealthy company who gets the land would still have the responsibility not to degrade the ecosystems and would still have to pay for any ecosystem degradation. And the poor laborer who has now lost his land and is still poor, although he sold his land, would still receive financial help for housing, education, whatever, food, security. Because if you combine the things, very strange things would happen. What, what happens if a poor landowner would sell his land? Then he would lose also the opportunity, um, the aid, he would lose it as well. So, this is on a very large scale, from a philosopher, philosopher, philosophical perspective, <coughs> um, discussion about whether it would be possible to scale up PES to a global level. And I think if PES becomes more than voluntary schemes, and you really want to base financial flows between countries, for protection of larger areas, then it might become uh, 
troubling for pests. Thank you for your attention.